Welcome to the Business of Healthcare, a twice monthly podcast from the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management. The center is based at the Naveen Jindal School of Management at the University of Texas at Dallas. The show, like the center, brings together business leaders and other forward thinkers to discuss how best to meet the challenges of a rapidly changing, increasingly complex healthcare industry. I'm your host, Dr. Britt Barrett. We're delighted to have Dr. Jim Rickards with us on our podcast. He's the author of Our Health Plan, Community Governed Healthcare That Works. It's a new uh, book that I just actually captured my attention and my interest and and really speaks to some of the contemporary healthcare issues we're challenged with. So, Jim, it's, it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate this. Now, I, I got a copy of this book, and I plowed right through it. First of all, can you give us a little bit of your background? What brought you to this point? And, and then second, your passion for the idea of community-governed health care. Yeah, so I'm a radiologist by training. And the first six, eight years of my life, I spent in a dark room talking to myself, as most radiologists do, and, you know, really enjoyed the practice. But, you know, after about eight years in practice and actually practicing in a small town in rural Oregon, I kind of became a little bit frustrated with things. And it wasn't for the usual frustrations that you hear doctors or providers talk about, like declining reimbursement or increasing administrative burden. But in my case, I was becoming frustrated because, believe it or not, I was getting to know my patients too well. And now you might be taken aback and go, well, wait a minute, you're a doctor. Don't you want to know your patients well? And my response is, well, yeah, if you're a family practice doc, primary care physician of some sort, or maybe an OBGYN, then by all means, you should know everything there is to know about your patients. But the fact is, I'm a radiologist, and the way I practice medicine is with imaging exams that can be very expensive and also expose people to radiation and lead to a risk of increased cancer down the line. So my challenge was I was seeing the same individuals come back time and time again for imaging studies and not seeing a lot of change in a lot of these and not feeling that, you know, I was really delivering a lot of value. And a lot of times we we think of these folks and there were particular it was a particular issue for folks from an emergency department. We somewhat pejoratively call these individuals the frequent flyers in, in the medical community. And so I was frustrated that we had so many frequent flyers in the small community. And this was a town where, you know, I literally knew everybody. I couldn't go to a store without seeing another primary care physician or maybe someone that worked in the social uh, worker industry. And it turns out that my wife was actually a social worker in town. And we would connect and talk about a lot of the patients that I would see because there are also her clients that she would see in the behavioral health setting. But while we, we, we would connect informally over the dinner table or at our house, we didn't have a way to professionally connect. And it wasn't just because I was a radiologist. There wasn't really any way for us to coordinate care in the different areas that determine our health. So the, 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 the medical side of the, of the healthcare system was not necessarily working with the behavioral health side, was not working with behavioral health, was not working with dental care. And so and this was a particular problem with our Medicaid population. So we were delivering a lot of care, but it was, you know, very siloed. And it wasn't siloed just in the medical aspects of healthcare, but in those other areas too. You know, the, the medical piece wasn't talking to the social work piece and et cetera. And so this was something that I, I became aware of. And I started, you know, to learn more about actually what goes into making us healthy. And now it's kind of in vogue for people to talk about the, the determinants or the social determinants of health. And I started to learn about how only 10% of our health is actually determined by the medical care we receive. So here I am, you know, doing the best I can to interpret these CT scans and x-rays, and my colleagues in the emergency department are doing everything they can to stabilize people and discharge them. But 90% of individuals' health is determined by other things like behavioral health, by their social circumstances, by their employment, by their education, by their genetics, access to transportation. And these were all areas that I really had very little influence over. You know, I'm, I'm not a social worker, but I didn't have a, a solid connection with those other areas that make up our health. And, and so this started to become frustrating for me. And I thought, you know, I went to medical school to help individuals, but then also I want to help populations and communities get healthy. So how can I make that happen? And in, in, 
most cases, there's there's not one single organization that can act as an umbrella to align payment and strategies and goals and mission and vision to bring that all those areas of health, those all those determinants together under one roof and, and allow collaboration. And so that was kind of where I was about eight years into my career. And really, at the same time, the state of Oregon was uh, kind of undergoing a large change in how it approached Medicaid. Um, so, you know, in the U.S., there's basically three ways we pay for uh, health care. There's commercial insurance, which you get through an employer or you purchase on the exchange. There's Medicare for people 65 years of age and over. And then there's Medicaid for economically disadvantaged individuals. And our Medicaid system in Oregon, we realized we had a really forward thinking um, executive uh, governor, uh, Governor John Kitzhaber, he happened to be a physician and some leadership in our um, state house and, and Senate who, who realized that we needed to do something different for our Medicaid uh, members, that the costs were unsustainable, the access to care wasn't there, and the quality could be improved upon. So the idea was to create a new type of health care payment system and delivery system for Medicaid called the Coordinated Care Organization. And when I first heard about it, I thought that this made tremendous sense because the idea was to create these new health plans that would be governed by the communities they serve. And the state would basically pay each of these health plans a global budget, a fixed amount uh, for every member they covered that that health plan would then need to use to pay for not just medical care, but behavioral health, dental care and other services like non-emergency medical transportation. So all of a sudden you have this single health plan governed by the community of the providers who are in the network of it, but then also by the members who are served by it that is responsible for developing a single mission and vision and definition of what a uh, community health looks like for a defined population. It has a fixed global budget it has to manage. It has a set set of performance metrics it has to meet. And it provides a governance platform for, for members of the community to get involved in, in you know, making the tough choices and, and developing the strategies for improving the health of, of their lives and, and those in the population served. Well, I, I bet it's been quite a journey. I mean, I, I can't imagine the size and scope of what you, you undertook. Now, I recognize, and I think we all recognize, that clinicians, caregivers feel the same anxiety that you do. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes they're restricted because of reimbursement or policies and procedures. You guys took a big leap, and Oregon's been known for being very progressive in this space. Can we can we kind of get into this? What, how did you how did you define health? What you've expanded this the determination is moving from just specifically the medical care, but you've added behaviorists, you've added psychosocial issues. How how expansive did you get on dealing with the population? What what kind of services and programs did you have to include into this uh, previously determined or defined medical model to care for populations? Yeah, so a big part of it. So when the whole coordinated care model was rolled out about six years ago now, the state of Oregon did this because, one, we were in about a $1.9 billion deficit, largely <laughs> driven by Medicaid. And we realized I mean, you're not the only ones that are in that right. situation. It's just a- absolutely mind boggling. Yeah. And so, you know, as we approach 20 percent GDP for healthcare, oh. and are able to spend less on other things like education and transportation, et cetera, you know, we got to do something differently. And so right. typically when when states go to address a deficit or, or try to control healthcare costs related to Medicaid, they, they employ a combination of three strategies. One, they'll decrease the reimbursements that they provide to providers and hospitals. Well, that doesn't work because then the providers can't afford to see the Medicaid members and we lose access and then people go longer with chronic conditions or develop new problems that they can't get addressed. And when they do finally come for treatment through an emergency department, the care is a lot more expensive than it could have been if we would have been providing them preventative primary care all along. So that decreasing provider reimbursement doesn't work. The second strategy that's uh, typically employed is decreasing the number of covered benefits. So you may not allow for certain surgeries or treatments or tests. Well, that, again, um, can be an issue. You can only shorten that list of services so far. And in Oregon, we had in place what was called the prioritized list of services, which was based on evidence. 
And our list was actually kind of short already. So, you know, to still deliver a reasonable level of an amount of health care, we weren't going to be able to shorten that list anymore with approval from CMS, from the federal government. And then the third thing that um, uh, governments typically do to try to control costs is they will decrease the number of members covered. They'll decrease the, the covered lives. Well, we were going to be an expansion state, so that wasn't going to be a, 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 an option for us. We were going to go from about 600,000 to over a million Medicaid lives. So we needed to find a fourth path. And so we saw that we needed to do something different. So we had to acknowledge that, you know, there's more to making us healthy than just medical care. And if we were going to really try to wrap our arms around this problem, then we've got to include more than just medical care in these budgets. And we've got to pull together, you know, the leaders from public health, from behavioral health, from dental care organizations. So the state then created a coordinated care organization with the idea that each CCO would receive a fixed global budget to pay for all those major areas of health and that, in the state legislature, the governing boards of these entities even needed to have representatives from those areas, areas of health. So the state legislation says that local public health departments need to be included. L- local hospital leaders need to be included. Uh, one primary care physician needs to be included. One behavioral health therapy needs to be included on the board. You need to have other local representatives, like a local elected county official. So if you think about it, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that you have to have this organization and the legislation says, well, you have to have these leaders from these various areas of health, these various sectors of health. You have to have them combined together at the table making decisions cooperatively and managing one global budget. So to your question of how did we decide what to include, the legislation really laid out what needed to be included. I think it made a lot of sense and included the right people. Um, and, and so because of that, we were, we were forced to come together, and we did come together. And then now in an ongoing fashion, we have a set of what are called financial incentive metrics. There's now 18 of them that the state uses to assess how each CCO uh, is doing. And yeah. so some some of those metrics are things like are very medically focused, like colon cancer screening. But then some of them are what are called cross-cutting measures. So one of them, for instance, requires that every um, – child in foster care in a CC that is covered by a CCO and, and all foster care children receive Medicaid benefits and are, are covered by a CCO, that within 60 days of them entering foster care, they have to have a, uh, a physical or a medical assessment, a behavioral health assessment, and a dental care assessment. And so what that does then is it pushes the local uh, foster care agency to work with the medical the behavioral and the dental care organizations along with the CCOs. So now instead of having these siloed areas in the community that would have never have intentionally talked with one another or had a shared budget that they had to manage, now you have them needing to put in place plans to ensure that that foster child gets the appropriate care. And if not, then there's dollars at risk that the CCO could could lose for not meeting that. It's a, I mean, it's a daunting task. I understand that and your book describes how you began with a small community, as you mm-hmm. described, and then you scaled up to the to the state of Oregon. And so let, let's talk a little bit about that. It, I imagine that in a small community, it's easy to talk with uh, the schools and the hospitals and the public health folks and, you know, the law enforcement. It's easy to. How do you scale up to a a statewide effort? Are there pods or is it one Mm -hmm. statewide activity? Yeah, so these these coordinated care organizations, these CCOs, these community governed health plans, they all cover defined geographic regions by zip codes. And so the one that I was involved with, we were fortunate in that we really just had the zip codes for one county, Yamhill County. We did have a few zip codes from the surrounding counties where there's a little bit of overlap. But we have actually 16 of these CCOs across the state covering, you know, these defined geographic regions. One of the, the largest ones actually is in eastern Oregon, which is a very rural part of the state, and they actually cover 12 counties. So wow. the, the the state kind of defined based on the applications what the areas would be that were covered. Um, you know, in Portland, for instance, we have two CCOs that overlap a little bit, which makes for some interesting dynamics. But, you know, I, I think 
you, you got to have some type of rules of the road. And I think you got to have like a decision making body like the state that says, OK, well, these are, are your boundaries. These are your zip codes. This is yeah. going to be your population. And this, this has to be reasonable by some account. Um, and, so and here are 18 measurements of success or failure. And everyone's graded on that, uh, et cetera. You know, here at the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, the uh, Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management's focus is on the business of healthcare. And you clearly have the clinical uh, acuum and also received your MBA to add some of the business side. Let's flesh out what kind of business uh, expertise or processes or systems do you, you feel are important for these CCOs? What kind of disciplines do you need to business people to bring to the table to be effective in the CCO's operation? Yeah, a big focus of the CCO's is to use value-based payment models with their providers because the CCO's, they're essentially healthcare plans, but they're paid by the state of Oregon to then deliver benefits. Well, they have these 18 financial incentive metrics that the state uses in part to assess how the CCOs are doing and then also pays them based on how they're doing. So these financial incentive metrics, these performance measures, these are things that are actually performed by the provider community. The CCO doesn't do this work. The CCO doesn't do the colon cancer screening or the depression screening. So the CCO then needs to go to the provider network and say, you know, look, guys, we know you're delivering great care. You're providing access to our members. But it turns out the state of Oregon wants to see colon cancer screening done or depression management done at a certain rate. So can we work with you on making sure that we do that at a satisfactory level to meet this performance guarantee? And and the pushback from the providers might be, well, you know, I don't practice cookbook medicine. I treat the individual patient. And I say, well, yeah, I completely understand that. But when I look at what we're asking you to do, this is bread and butter stuff. You know, this is colon cancer screening. If I look at your electronic medical records, everyone over the age of 50 should have colon cancer screening, right? I mean, that's the national guideline. I don't think anybody's going to argue that. And if they don't want to have it, is it documented? Why not? Um, Same with the pregnant screening, et cetera. So, we then the CCOs need to go and work with the provider community and develop a payment model, a performance based uh, incentive model that will then reward clinics for, for meeting certain targets in those, in those areas. So if we're asking you to have colon cancer screening on 90% of your members, if you deliver that, well then we, we pay you a bonus at the end of the year because we get paid part of our budget from the state for, for meeting that metric. So that, that focus on value based care is, is really important. And it's not just, and it's not just performance based payments, but it's also a, a big part of this when it comes to value based care is around care management fees. So right. a lot of what we're asking the CTOs to do, it's not just deliver on specific metrics, but do things like provide more integrated care. So behavioral health and physical in- health integration. So having a behaviorist or a licensed a behavioral therapist within a primary care clinic to help provide coordinated care, you know, on the front lines is, is another big thrust of this. But a, a lot of those services, you know, they're difficult to bill for. There's, you know, hasn't been a lot of use of, of existing CPT codes for those services. So what CCOs can do then are pay care management fees, you know, kind of a, a per member per month uh, fixed rate for each member that's assigned to a primary care clinic. And then that gives the primary care clinic cash flow to hire a behaviorist to have them on staff to provide services to members um, to help manage their care, you know, right there to allow for warm handoffs and to help take care of the individual. I really like that a- approach because you gave specific structural objectives for the CCOs. Uh, the introduction of behaviorists, I think, is brilliant because that's a, a huge area that has not been addressed when we start looking at the old terminology like capitation or longitudinal care versus episodic care, all those things. But having a behaviorist able to jump into some of the determinants of health, another great process. You talked a lot about in your book about some things that don't have CPT codes, that mm-hmm. some things that just in the moment you've got to figure out. Can you speak to that? And was that a big issue or just an interesting element of the effort? Or is that is that really a serious concern in the, well, in the execution of the CCO? Yeah, well, and I, I think this gets to the point that, you know, these organizations are really community governed and go beyond more than just 
the medical aspects of our health because right. there's a lot of things that contribute to our health that there's not CPT codes for that okay. we need to pay for to keep people healthy. So, and, and when you form an organization like a CCO, it creates a lot of excitement and energy in the community and you start having people come forward with ideas, but not just ideas, but ideas that have been validated in, in other areas through research that actually work that, that they want to see paid for and implemented to improve the health of the population. And I'll give you an example of that. We helped start a paramedicine program. So essentially what we had were a number of paramedics with a fire department and ambulances who had a need to, to fill a hole in their budget, but then also had some extra capacity to do work. Now, typically when we think of ambulances and paramedics, we think of 911 and we think of emergency departments. Well, getting back to kind of what brought me into this, this line of work, the frequent flyers, the individuals who may be inappropriately using the emergency department, it's our paramedics and it's, you know, our emergency response system that really knows these individuals well. You know, they're out there in the community. They're the ones that are going to the same houses time and time again. So the idea was, well, let's leverage the knowledge of these paramedics and their resources, their ambulances and their skills and taking vitals and doing medication and management. And let's pay them to go out in the community and do non-emergent visits where the result is not going to be an expensive emergency department utilization, but is going to be something like a preventative visit. And so what we did then is we contracted with the local fire department to then go see some of these, quote, frequent flyers and do things like in-house safety checks. Are they living in a safe, stable, secure environment? Medication reconciliation, oftentimes because these individuals have been in and out of the hospital and emergency department multiple times. Nobody's been coordinating their medications and care, and they'll have pill bottles scattered around the house, and they need some help with organization. Maybe they need some help just learning how to use their in-home oxygen, or perhaps they have some other medical yeah. device. These are the folks that can get out there and do the non-emergent visit. One, they have the relationship. Two, they have the skills. We have the resources in the community. And, and they really want to do this because they were the ones that brought the idea forward. So we were able to support them in, in doing non-emergent visits on a percent of our population that had a certain number of emergency departments. So if you had more than six more emergency departments in, in a year, then we would send out the paramedicine folks. And then also we use them to help in transitions of care. So if you came, if you were being discharged from the hospital and you were hospitalized as a result of an emergency department visit, then we could have them go out there and do a follow-up visit with you to help you understand well, what just happened, what is the treatment plan. And then the paramedics could do other things, like say you're discharged and you need to have a lab drawn, but you're on Medicaid and you know transportation, right. they could do a lab draw. Or maybe you need your vitals checked to make sure things are going well and you don't need to go back into the hospital. So we were able to use that community resource, but there's no CPT code for those paramedicine visits right. by and large. You know? right. And so you know that's how we were kind of able to, to go beyond CPT codes to use the community resource and seeing great results of decreased admissions, you know, decreased ED utilization, et cetera. So. You know, it's interesting for me to hear hear you describe this, uh, your book and the work that you're doing, because it's almost like we've come full circle to get back to why we got into the delivery of healthcare to bless the lives of the people in the community we serve. And sometimes that doesn't fit into an artificial CPT code. It's bigger than that. And mm -hmm. great men and women like you are engaging in that process. Your book, Our Health Plan, community government healthcare that works. It really is inspiring. It's it's the beginning and it's inspiring to see a small community expand into a state run what 16 different CCOs mm -hmm. through the state of Oregon. Correct. Uh, two final questions for you. The first, if I'm listening to this and I am an aspiring healthcare leader and and I want to get involved in this and I want to uh, participate, what what words of caution would you give? Maybe one or two words of caution and then Let's finish up with where are you taking this? Because I can't imagine that this will be confined within the great state of Oregon. My guess is that this is bigger. So what words of advice would you give individuals yeah. like walking down this road? And, and where are we taking this? Yeah, I would say, you know, just be patient and realize this is going to take time. One, because you're now asking 
various sectors of the healthcare community to work together that never really have worked together, especially haven't shared a budget together. So if you're asking a county public health department and a, a dental office, and a hospital emergency department, and a social service agency to all share a budget, that's something very novel. There's going to be, you know, different terminology, different mm-hmm. understandings of cash flow. So you have to take it slow and allow for time for people to understand each other's business models and just philosophies on healthcare because they're going to be different and you don't want to create conflicts and people to pull back from the table. So just realize that. And, and really with that, you know, this is all about relationships and it's community relationships. And this work starts with building trust and understanding in those relationships. And then to your your second question, you know, we're seeing um, more of these types of organizations form around the country. They're typically, though, formed as ACOs, accountable care organizations. And I think that's a, that's great. And they're a step in the right direction. But they're typically medically focused. And so I would just encourage that, you know, you need to bring in public health. You need to bring in dental. You need to bring in social okay. services. You need to bring in transportation, even early childhood education, if you're really going to be successful. So that's just maybe another word of advice on this. Well, we can't thank you enough. Uh, Dr. Rickards, uh, your your work is inspiring. We are excited to see and hear what you personally and your efforts will do into the future. Uh, the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management at the University of Texas at Dallas, you, we're focused on the business of healthcare, and that's not pejorative in any way, shape, or form. It's a recognition that it's a $3 trillion industry, and there is a big industrial medical complex out there, and we need to collaborate and coordinate and, as, as you mentioned, build relationships to care for those that are sick and afflicted in our communities and be that uh, inspiration, and which you, you, you clearly are. So uh, we thank you for your time. We wish you the best. Uh, I would encourage the listeners to reach out. Uh, the book is called Our Health Plan, Community Governed Healthcare That Works, and it was uh, published in August of 2017. The author is our guest tonight, uh, Jim Rickards, uh, and we're just delighted to have you with us, and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. That was fun. Thanks for joining us here on the Business of Healthcare podcast. Join us online at businessofhealthcarepodcast.com to find episodes, notes, links, and more. And be sure to subscribe to the Business of Healthcare podcast on iTunes, or your favorite podcasting app. To learn more about the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, go to jindal.utdallas.edu and then search under the Centers and Institutes tab on the navigation menu. I'm Dr. Britt Barrett, Director of the Center for Healthcare Leadership and Management, where we're leading change by changing how we lead.